We're back with David Strom, who's a cybersecurity journalist at SiliconANGLE. We're talking about the intersection of data protection, specifically backup and recovery, um, and cybersecurity generally. David, good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Awesome. Thank you. And, uh, you know, last time we had you on was as part of SuperCloud. You've been knocking it down on the security portal on uh, SiliconANGLE, doing some great work. Uh, you know, gearing up for RSA, you know, <laughs> early next year. Uh, but so let's talk a little bit about this notion of backup and recovery, so-called data protection. We hear a lot about air gaps. We hear a lot about ransomware recovery and and the whole mosaic of cybersecurity. Where do you see those pieces fitting together? Well, they don't really fit together all that well. And that's, I think, part of the problem that we're still talking about them. You know, when ransomware was first a thing, it was uh, it was highlighting the fact that people don't do their backups very well. They don't check them to make sure that they actually are intact. They don't uh, back up all the right kinds of data. Um, they don't understand the, the um, craft that uh, ransomware gangs ploy on them to to get into their network and to um, do damage to their their systems, but now we have these multi-point ransomware uh, exercises. They just don't encrypt the data and hold it a ransom. They then make fun of you and they shame you on uh, on their own website. Uh, they try to sell the data to uh, people on the dark web. Uh, we even have a case this summer where the ransomware actor filed a SEC compliance uh, disclosure saying that their victim hadn't come, hadn't disclosed that they had been uh, been breached. I mean, you know, the nerve of them. <laughs> it's, just out, it's out of control. Yeah, you covered that story. And uh, it is, it is uh, quite a position for the, 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 the criminal to sort of call foul. Uh, so, but, you know, as an observer of this industry for a, a long, long time, what are the things that you see are real, what is triggering you that you think is is vapor? You know, we talk a lot about zero trust. You and I have had this conversation before. Uh, you know, the narrative is it's a journey, uh, but it's starting to, to get a lot of traction in the CISO community. What is your take on the state of zero trust? What's real, what's vapor? What should, how should customers be thinking about this? I think they should very carefully evaluate any product that claims to be the first or the only in this space, because most of the security uh, tenants are things that we've been talking about for decades. So there's a lot of vendors that have jumped on the, the zero trust bandwagon, and we still don't have uh, enterprises that are doing adaptive uh, security control. You know, they, they view uh, authentication as one and done. You log into your computer in the morning, and that's all you need to do. And there's no uh, evaluation of your risk profile as it changes during the day uh, or uh, additional checks to make sure that it's really you and not somebody who is acting like you. You know, and those are really simple things to talk about. They're a lot harder to implement. But that's what's really going to go a long way towards implementing zero trust. Well, and it's like, I feel like there's a lot of paper cuts. And so there's products that you can buy, there's software, there's tooling, uh, there's skills that you can bring to the table. And then there's all these other little things that you, you for instance, just mentioned. Those are the things that, David, it seems like it's hard to operationalize. Uh, are, there, are there tools to help operationalize the tools? <laughs> Is that where we're headed? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'll give you a, a, really, a real example. So I got today the new Google Fido Titan uh, USB key. It's a little, you know, a little piece of plastic that fits into your into your drive, and also can use the radio frequencies for phones that don't normally have the same connector. And so I figured, oh great, I'll just add it to my bank account as another authentication device. So I go online, I go to my bank account. I navigate to 37 menus to fi finally get to that spot. And I've maxed out my number of security keys that I can use in my bank account. And the maximum number you can use is two, which is ridiculous. Uh, you know, I've got a 10 or 11 of them. Uh, why, why limit it to two? 
Yeah, it's just, it's totally pointless. So, you know, you, you have the, it, the proof is in the pudding and the applications are really the last frontier where they, these security features can be implemented. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, you know, you and I were trading notes last night about air gaps and we talked about the Natanz uh, 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 uranium enrichment facility which was the target of the Stuxnet virus. Natanz was air-gapped, right? The, right. Presumably, the U.S. and Israeli uh, uh, actors got in to speed up the centrifuges and so forth. Um, so air-gaps are really important. Uh, well, don't get me wrong, but to your point and the things we were talking about earlier, there are a lot of these little paper cuts that people need to think about. Um, and so... Add some color to your perspective on air gaps and what else we need to stay protected. Well, the problem with the air gaps is that they're very deceptive, as the people who are operating that centrifuge plant found out. Because you know, once a week they would take this was another USB uh, thumb drive, uh, put it in their Windows computer, download the latest uh, configuration for the centrifuges, and then walk it over the ten or twenty feet across that air gap to where they would upload it to the uh, controllers on those on those units. So the air gap was giving them a false sense of, of security and the 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 um uh, the spies figured this out and they also really weaponized Stuxnet. I think it had seven zero days. And all it was designed to do was to just infect those centrifuges and have them spin out of control. And so it must have infected hundreds of thousands of computers and did absolutely nothing until it found a, uh, a centrifuge to connect. And there's a, there's a group of researchers in, uh, at, at Ben-Gurion University in Israel, which I've been to several times, and they have a long list of ways that you can defeat air gaps, uh, disk drive lights, um, sounds that your computer makes. I mean, just it's an incredible set of things. As long as your computer is operating, doing something, they can figure out a protocol that can transmit data across an air gap. So it's it's very very deceptive. And I think the but I think the point is we're not saying don't do air gaps. Do air gaps, but don't think just because you have an air gap that you can just ignore some of these other factors. I don't know if I've been I've been pumping up all week this book, A Restaurant in Jaffa. I don't know if you've read it. Uh, it's, it's, I, I just downloaded it. Thanks for your recommendation. Oh, good. I, I, I'm, I'm glad it's, it's, it's really well done. And, and I, I suggest people just take a look because it really does uh, underscore how fragile our critical infrastructure is. Um, I wanted to come back and ask you about a conversation that we were having, uh, last night, um, in email. And I was saying that, you know, get your opinion that historically data protection, backup and recovery has been thought of as a bolt on, um, and and then you've got cybersecurity sort of, in my view, was kind of separate. And, I, and you responded, you said, I think by bolt on, you mean that there are two distinct groups within an organization. I thought this was really interesting. One that manages the backups and one that manages the overall cybersecurity processes. And you said, you're not sure that that's really the case. The conflict, if there ever was one, was between the network infrastructure group and the, and the SecOps group who was going to claim ownership you know, over the proper backups, maybe how to do a proper backup. What are those organizational considerations that people should be thinking about? Well, you'd have two problems. In small organizations, the network people and the security people is often the same single person. And so that person is just overwhelmed with, pro you know, with problems and trying to keep the trains running, which is what the network guys are supposed to do, and try to keep them from crashing, uh, which is what the security guys are supposed to do. In the larger organizations, there's turf wars. You know, who controls what? If I have a firewall for my uh, digital uh, web estate, let's say, of applications, um, then I have a third group of people who are, the, you know, the developers who are developing those applications. And they're usually thinking about security very late in the game. The network people have invested millions of dollars in, you know, five, nine bulletproof infrastructure so they don't necessarily want to change anything uh, because they think their network is just fine. Thank you. 
uh, and it, it may not be as segmented as somebody would like or segmented at all. You know, we still have companies that run their whole infrastructure on a single network segment, which is just crazy. Okay. It, it violates all security principles that we've known for decades. Well, right. And, and of course, there's that, that cost versus, you know, protection. How much, how much, you know, do you want to invest? But, but even in that case, there's probably some really good $5 fixes that you can do. I also, I forgot to mention when we were talking about air gaps, you wrote a piece that you turned me on to. I wasn't aware of it. Here's how hackers can steal your data using light, radio, and sound waves. So this was something also that, again, when we think about, you know, critical infrastructure, when we think about air gaps, there's just so many uh, novel techniques uh, that maybe mainstream media hasn't been re reporting on. That one blew me away, David, um, that, that article that you wrote. Yeah, well, that, those are all the, the Ben-Gurion researchers. They have a specialty group of, of people that do that. And every so often they come out with yet another way to do uh, to defeat air gaps. Yeah. What are the things that, um, you know, we always talk about the, 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 the threat landscape and the shifting threat landscape. Uh, a lot of focus now, uh, um, certainly there was a lot of focus on cloud. Uh, we're getting an increased emphasis on IoT, critical infrastructure. What are the things that you're watching that maybe, again, aren't mainstream that you think are going to affect that threat landscape in, in the coming, you know, two, three, four, five years? Well, I think people are underestimating the, the uh, level of expertise with the threat actor, actors and hackers. There's a lot more blended threats, you know, like I mentioned with ransomware. The same is true with uh, denial of service attacks where they're combining that with all sorts of other techniques. Uh, there are better ways to hide in plain sight in an infrastructure so that the, the detection tools fail at finding uh, the, the malware and leave, leave them resident sometimes for months at a time. So the, the, the situation is getting more complicated. The attack groups are getting better educated. They're buying more um, threats as a service type of things, just like everybody's buying more cloud uh, applications. They're doing the same thing and they're combining all these tools. The average phishing threat, for example, has you know 30 automated steps that an attacker can run to get into your into your network. You know, they just they just have one set of tools that feeds into another set of tools. Uh, where those used to be manual methods or where uh, a phishing uh, exploit when was just one or two steps in the past. Ah, so much more sophisticated. So you're saying if you click on the link, it sets off a series of automated events that 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 the uh, doesn't require a human. I don't know about you, but I've I've seen the phishing uh, attacks become much more. I don't want to say sophisticated because I'm not qualified to, to say so, but um, a, a lot more enticing from a user's perspective. Uh, a lot less obvious, let me say. And I guess my question to you is, I'm, as I've suspected, that it's, it's in the large part because of generative AI, uh, but and maybe other AI, what's your, your take on that? I think we're just beginning to see the AI-based enhancements. I think most of these attacks that have happened so far, you know, where you, you have a package uh, that can't be delivered, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, and especially now around the holidays, you know, why the post office would send me a SMS message about my package, you know, they don't. So you, you just have to be very skeptical. You have to be very much uh, have the presence of mind. You know, if you're looking at your phone and you're not really paying attention, it's easy to click on something and get trapped. So you know, it's, it's, it really behooves all of us to be more careful about what we're doing when we're looking at, at stuff. Yeah, Lena Smart from MongoDB says, it's, it's simple, just don't click on links. <laughs> David, 
Thanks so much. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is like seriously. Don't click on links unless you are hundred percent certain that it's the a person you trust. And even then, double check. Uh, right. David, thanks so much for taking some time. Really appreciate your your insights as always and your in your great reporting. Check him out at SiliconAngle.com. Thanks a lot. Pleasure to be with you. All right, we're cranking along. We're live in studio and on demand at, in our Palo Alto studios. You're watching Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, a summit bringing together practitioners. We got cyber experts. We have independent analysts, technology experts, and we're exploring the cybersecurity and data protection intersection. Keep it right there.